Hi there. Is this Dr. Charles Pollack? It is. Dr. Pollack, you are live on the Valder Beebe Show, broadcasting live from Dallas, Texas, on a global platform. Good morning. You've got a great audience, so thank you for being my guest today. My pleasure. I want to let my audience know that Dr. Charles Pollack is a medical doctor. He's a professor of emergency medicine. And Dr. Pollack, tell me about AFib. That's, you know, that's, that's a word that everybody thinks they know what it is because of that commercial that comes on. Right. We don't really know. Yeah, uh, AFib or atrial fibrillation, uh, Valder, is, is the most common abnormal heart rhythm we see in medicine. Uh, two to three million people in the United States have it today, probably more because it doesn't always cause symptoms. Uh, what's even more sobering is that over the next 20 to 30 years, that will more than double because AFib is more common in older people and of course the population is aging. Atrial fibrillation results when the atria, the, the top smaller chambers of the heart, don't beat in a coordinated fashion. And when they do that, two things happen. One, the ventricles, the, the larger chambers of the heart that pump blood out to the body, the ones when you feel beating, you feel on your pulse, uh, on your wrist or your neck, don't beat in a regular fashion. Often they beat fast, but by definition, they beat irregularly. And patients often notice that. They have palpitations or they have dizziness or they have shortness of breath or chest pain. The other implication of atrial fibrillation besides those symptoms is that in those abnormally beating atria, blood clots can form. And those blood clots can ultimately be propelled by the ventricles out into the bloodstream and cause problems, most important of which is when they get propelled to the brain and the patient has a stroke. The AFib, is it just because we're older or is it because there's something wrong with us? No, there's generally something wrong. Now, the, the incidence of AFib certainly goes up as you get older. In fact, if you've made it to 75 and don't have AFib yet, there's a one in four chance you're going to have AFib uh, at some point in the rest of your remaining life. But generally, AFib occurs uh, in, in association with other heart disease, like coronary artery disease. It can cause a heart attack or congestive heart failure. Sometimes it occurs without any known associated issue. It's more common in obese patients. It's more common in smokers. It's more common in patients who have sleep apnea. So we have lots of associations, but a lot of times we don't know what causes AFib. And in many patients, it's the only heart disease they have. Okay, so what do we do since we've got this one in four chance of getting this, no matter what we do, it seems. Is it, can I be healthy now and, and, and try to avoid that? Well, you know, it's, it's heart health month. And generally speaking, things that one would do to decrease the risk of coronary artery disease, which causes heart attacks, will also reduce the risk of AFib. So don't smoke, get regular exercise, eat a good diet, see your doctor regularly. But you may do all of those things and still develop AFib. So if you develop AFib, what's important is that it be recognized. Again, most patients have these symptoms that I described before, palpitation, shortness of breath, chest pain, but not all patients do. So if you're just not feeling right, you feel your pulse rate and it's consistently irregular, it's not, you know, everybody has an occasional skip beat, but if it's consistently not beating regularly, that's something that should be checked. It's very easy, just get an electrocardiogram, an EKG, and we can see if you're an AFib. But we need to recognize that it's there because that's when the stroke risk starts. As soon as you go into AFib, the likelihood of those abnormal clots forming starts to increase. Okay, we've talked about the problem, we've talked about the cause, what's the solution? Well, AFib itself doesn't kill you, but the complications of AFib may. Again, what we worry about most is those blood clots forming, and the way we treat that is to give the patient an anticoagulant, a blood thinner, that reduces the likelihood that this abnormal clotting is going to occur. For many years, decades, the only option we had for thinning a patient's blood with a pill over a long period of time was warfarin. Uh, many of your viewers and listeners will have heard of warfarin. It's not a particularly user-friendly drug. It requires monitoring, which means blood draws regularly. Uh, it's associated with a, a bleeding risk, particular bleeding inside the brain, which of course is very bad. And it can interact with other drugs that AFib patients may be taking. It even limits the diet that you can eat. So we're fortunate that over the last four or five years, we've had four new drugs approved by the FDA. The first of them was dabigatran or Predaxa that work at least as well as warfarin, in some cases better, in reducing stroke risk, 
don't have as much bleeding risk, in fact have a much lower bleeding risk of, of uh, bleeding within the brain, and are much easier to use. Patients don't have to be monitored, they don't have to worry about what they eat. For the most part, the, the, these drugs don't interfere with other, uh, other drugs that patients may be taking. So we're making the treatment of AFib easier, but it's still something that it's, it's very important for patients to, to, to follow their doctor's recommendation and to take their medications as they're prescribed. Dr. Pollock, where can my audience find out more information? Uh, Valder, again, this is a fairly common problem, and so there are lots of sources of information out of the web. I would say they're not all uh, totally reliable. I'd suggest that your, your uh, viewers and listeners start with the American Heart Association webpage. They have a patient-facing page where there's some really good, unbiased information, and go forward from there. Dr. Tom, uh, Dr. Pollock, i got to ask you, uh, you're doing this, this emergency medicine. Where can we find you? Because if I get sick, I'm coming to find you because you sound <laughs> smart. Well, thank you very much. I'm in, I'm in Philadelphia. There are a lot of big teaching hospitals in Philadelphia. I'm at Thomas Jefferson University, uh, and I'll be happy to see you if you're in town and you need emergency care. Well, I think I need to move to Philadelphia just in case because I'm a baby boomer. Dr. Pollock, but I want to thank you for being my guest. I'm going to try to stay healthy and well as I can and not be one of those statistics. Thank you for being my guest on the Velder BB Show. My pleasure.